It really whips the technological convergence. <laughs> 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 this is Control Structure, episode 150 for October 24th, 2018. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs150 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. It creaks a bit. You have been upgraded. Well, yeah, because uh, the Microsoft is now on a boom that just arrived today as of recording. So you don't feel my, my computer vibrating as lo- loud now? Hopefully not. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, only been the normal amount of time this time. Only the normal amount of time? Yes, <laughs> yes, just the... The, was it four night or four week or whatever it is? Two weeks. T- t- two weeks. One. So, have any of your critters break in, broke out? Uh, if by breaking out the rabbits went from one pen to another pen, kind of, but they on, stayed on, within the rabbit pen. On their own volition? Well, they kind of dug a hole underneath between the two <laughs> pens, so they decided to just go back and forth as they wanted to. <laughs> but I put them in a new pen, so it's fine now. Okay. So, um, let's see, it was, yeah, it was, I believe it was last Tuesday, uh, or, uh, I forget, I forget, let's see, need to, need to get dates on this thing. Uh, so yeah, it was a week ago, like last Wednesday, that, uh, YouTube went down. Like, you, you could, you know, see the homepage, but there was no video. Across America, thousands of TVs went dark. Yes, and lots of kids uh, wondered what in the world had happened. Uh, you know, they just suddenly looked up from their iPads and started freaking out. <laughs> the internet is down! <laughs> yeah, and uh, let's see, according to one guy, his 2.5-year-old has had a moment. A moment. <laughs> yes. Trauma. <laughs> Apparently. Wow. <laughs> so, um... Let's see. I've not been able to uh, locate any kind of report as to exactly what happened. So, you know, again, my tinfoil hat says that this was some kind of state-sponsored spon- attack. But the but the realist in me says it was probably someone fat-fingering a configuration somewhere. I'm, I'm voting for a chaos monkey got out of his pen. <laughs> oh, so we're Netflix now, huh? Who knows? <laughs> Um, so yeah, no streaming video, but, um, you know what, uh, might help in this situation? What's that? Winamp. Winamp? Yeah, you remember Winamp? I thought we were going to talk about pure YouTubing. Well, we can do that. Okay. Uh, eventually. Eventually. But might as well talk about Winamp since I mentioned it. Okay. (laughs) So, uh, it was sold to a company called Radio Nami about five years ago. Uh, in fact, I believe we might have covered it. Uh, so, but for the first time in five years, there has been an update after a pre-release uh, 5.8 build leaking. They've decided to just make it real. Like, you know, this is this is it. You know, everyone's, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, you know, using this anyway. Everyone's excited. So, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, and they are planning uh, big things for next year. Uh, with, uh, you know, uh, version 6, you know, enough to warrant a f- complete version number. Uh, so, yeah. So that they had compatibility fixes for Windows 10 and such? That probably makes some people happy. Um, I'm not exactly sure what those were, since I've been using Windows 10 with Winamp all this time. In fact, I very rarely don't have it open. It's always open on my desktop. So, PeerTube. PeerTube. So, uh, you found this cool thing called, uh, what's the exact name of it? Oh, no, it was on the, on the Hacker News link. Yes. Right after, uh. Like the first comment yeah, or something. The first comment, it links to this GitHub of this guy, uh, that has a peer tube. And it was kind of cool because it's YouTube, but peer to peer. So it literally runs BitTorrent in your web browser. Uh, even though when we tested it, apparently you have things blocked, so we can't do it. But anyways, we can still steal the bandwidth from people. <laughs> so it still works. 
I thought it was a cool concept, though, because literally that can help out with uh, things such as the net neutrality and things if uh, that was a problem, because people can block that. So, and uh, there's also YouTube alternatives, like more of a centralized mm -hmm. uh, stuff, uh, like BitChute. There's uh, some open source software, too, that copies YouTube. I forget the name of it now, but there's one that's pretty, like, it looks like YouTube, like, very much so. So, uh, Intel, uh, you know those people that make fast CPUs? Kind of fast CPUs? Uh, they've announced and released the Core i9 uh, series and the uh, pretty much the whole 9000 series uh, CPUs. And they're a little bit faster, but they're a lot more expensive. Um, and But I think the more notable thing about this is that they published some very questionable benchmarks, uh, or at least they paid someone to publish some very uh, questionable, ben questionable benchmarks that uh, pretty much gimped the AMD CPUs they were testing. Mm. So they could say, oh yeah, you know, this Intel thing is like, you know, 50% faster. Um, and I think one of the, two of the uh, things that pretty much stood out is that the Intel CPUs had, like, faster memory, uh, and uh, the AMD CPUs had on game mode, which is really only supposed to be used for Threadripper processors, but not for Ryzen. Mm. Uh, so if you recall that, uh, uh, like, the core complex thing that, uh, like, AMD uh, was the Ryzen CPUs have, like, eight cores on, like, one die... Uh, whereas Threadripper is, like, two of those. They're, like, two separate dies. Okay. So, like, there's some lag going from one die to the other. Mm hmm So what game mode does is essentially disables half of the CPUs. That way you don't keep jumping back and forth. Yeah. Okay. So if you do this on Ryzen, that also disables half of your CPUs. <laughs> so you're... Yeah, half as fast. So your eight-core chip is now a four-core. <laughs> I would slow it down. So, yeah. Uh, turns out that uh, they're not as slow as uh, uh, these misleading benchmarks would uh, assume they were. So, uh, have you ever been mystified by TLS and, uh, you know, the transport layer security protocol? No, when, you, when you're doing the packet sniffing, you see a lot of things going back and forth. So, uh, like... How should I say this? I have a fairly solid idea of like what, uh, like how the encryption sort of works, uh, but not how the handshake and everything works. Uh, so uh, we have a very nice uh, explanation of what all of these fields are in like all these packets going back and forth. Uh, so for instance, you know, the record header, the handshake header, uh, like all these IDs, like how the cipher suites are specified, uh, all all this fun stuff that uh, like on the low level, you know, like bits on the wire kind of thing, which is kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. It was neat how you pointed out that you could even hover over the different bits and it would show you kind of exactly what it was. I thought that was cool. Yeah, good breakdown. So if you remember last last time, we mentioned that uh, the new Windows update was. Uh, deleting people's files. Yes. Update Windows. <laughs> <laughs> update Windows, delete everything. <laughs> so, uh, they have... Microsoft has located the bug in what it was doing. And so, you know how those... Uh, how Windows has, like, a folder for your documents and mm -hmm. your music and your videos and your pictures and other things? Yes. And uh, did you know that you can apparently... Uh, create new uh, types of folders. So instead of having like your documents folder on one drive, you can have it on another one instead. So if you have a solid state or something, probably a fair amount of people would do that to get their fast writes on and off of big things. Um, yeah. So uh, it turns out that if you had, uh, say, uh, got your documents folder and moved it to another drive or something that there would be two folders, mm -hmm. the new one and the old one. Uh, whereas, 
and the problem was this update would notice the old folder and just delete it. It wouldn't it wouldn't move any of the files. It wouldn't even check if there are files in there. It would just delete it. But to make it even better, OneDrive would do this thing and leave files behind with some of the older versions. So some people that ate all Microsoft dog food <laughs> got hit with this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, <coughs> uh, are you talking about the OneDrive thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, old versions of OneDrive, uh, if you you know said, oh, yeah, I'd like to you know store my stuff in the cloud because that's what all the cool kids are smoking, uh, that the like some of the old OneDrive clients would just create an empty folder in the OneDrive but not move anything over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the Windows update would see that old folder and, you know, delete everything. So, see ya. <laughs> Made it more funny just because it's not a... Not that the user set it up that way, but it's actually you could have legitimately just installed something from Microsoft and messed it up. Yeah. Microsoft stuff doesn't work with Microsoft. <laughs> Is anyone surprised, honestly? I was impressed with Windows today. I was like, woo, Windows has a great feature. I like, I actually might like give Windows some good credit here. Like on Slack, I right clicked and it has like, cause my Slack window got lost in the other monitor and I right clicked and it's like, move to current display. I'm like, cool. Like this is just what I need. <laughs> and then I, I mentioned that to someone else and they're like, oh, that's a Slack feature, not a Windows feature. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, you right click on the icon. And if it's on the other display to come back, but it doesn't work for anything else. It's just Slack. I thought it was a Windows feature yeah. for a second. Like, I got really excited. It's like, Windows did something right? No, they didn't. Not that one. Uh, so, something that Windows doesn't exactly do right, um, well, or at least uh, a debug uh, application included with, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's Windows itself or some, uh, you know, other tools, uh, but... Uh, there's this uh, was it application verifier that uh, pretty much creates a log file for every process that's created with it. So uh, Bruce Dawson, our uh, friend who finds all sorts of fun bugs in Windows, uh, you know the guy that uh, uh, oh, we'll see what are the fun bugs uh, like a recently compiled file would just be all zeros and blank. Uh, the other one where, uh, like, the processes could not uh, exit quickly because there is, like, some kind of single thread mm-hmm. in the uh, close handler. Uh, so, you know, he he pretty much runs into these because he's the guy that builds Chrome for Windows. Uh, in so doing, launches a compiler 30,000 times to make a build of Chrome. Uh, so... If he attaches this app application verifier thing to the compiler process, you know there will be three hundred or uh, thirty thousand uh, uh, you know compiler mm-hmm. processes you know being created, and you know there would be like compiler.exe.0.log dot zero dot log for the first one, compiler.exe.1.log dot one dot log for the second, and you know and so forth. Uh, so once you get down to a lot, uh, there's the lag in querying if those log files exist and if it should you know look for the next number. So it ends up being a O to the N squared operation. Uh, so with this, the process creation is kind of slow. Um, I'm not so essentially the solution is that since this. Uh, verifier program is uh depreciated uh the thing is just don't log to file (laughs) uh and suddenly instead of uh like all this uh you know compilation process taking like an hour it'll take a minute i think in his case he was saying it was like a 10 hour build with his thirty thousand yeah builds or something yeah so instead of taking 10 minutes it'll Mm -hmm. take 10 hours uh so yeah fun times with that (laughs) so we haven't really been that friendly to google recently right even though we use google docs even though we use google docs um so came across an article that kind of analyzes uh how it's sort of you know decaying from the inside 
in that it seems that some of the uh, management have like these completely far out ideas uh, that don't exactly line up with their customers. Uh, so uh, Lauren Weinstein has uh, actually spoken at Google and uh, she noticed the uh, the disparity even back then. Um, that was 2006, I believe, when yes. she had spoken. Yes. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a thick article, but I found it a pretty good read uh, about what's happening and uh, compares it to, you know, companies like AT&T and, uh, uh, was it, Digital Equipment Corporation? Uh about how they just kind of drifted away from their customers. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, kind of a sad story, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll be watching. So, something that was not created by Google, uh, jQuery. Uh, have you used jQuery? Uh, briefly, not a tremendous amount, though. So the uh, like the default uh, e-commerce store that I work with is essentially based on jQuery. Uh, at least, like, the UI part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, what is it? Django. Or is it Django or uh, Drupal? That's the other one. There's, like, so many content management systems these days. Uh-huh. So, Drupal uh, has gone through and factored out jQuery from pretty much everything. Uh, so, they've... Uh, this is a content management system, so think, like, blogs mm-hmm. and like podcast websites even. Uh, So they've looked at, you know, their user base and found that, you know, very little uh, of their users would even benefit from jQuery. Uh, They still have it, though. So they're like, you know, we could probably get rid of this and save quite a bit on page load at times, making everything faster. So they uh, went through and refactored and shaved off quite a bit of code uh, from each page. Uh, So in fact, uh, trying to skim this article here. Uh, So the most popular, uh, well, they they say this most popular content type uh, was uh, like a 47K, like gzipped file uh, after taking out jQuery it went down to 15. So, like, suddenly you're loading much less than half of what you uh, were before, uh, and it might even run faster. I'm not sure, but, hey, I'll mm-hmm. take it. <laughs> if this if this was me, yeah, I'd definitely take it. And their point was that, uh, from a server perspective, it makes a big deal, because he said, like, he says they have over 5 million page views to their article, and it says... In 30 days, it's about 150 gigabytes of bandwidth so uh, that they've saved. Mm-hmm. So that's a big deal for servers, too, from that perspective. So, yeah, uh, increase page load times and save on your bandwidth. So let's go back to something very, very old. Uh, so you remember QuickTime? Yes, I remember QuickTime. Yeah, like I essentially, I hated it, especially because anything that I watched in it, uh, you could not... Uh, you know, you could not watch videos in full screen unless you paid them. I'm like, well, that's an advanced feature. According to who? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, browsers can full screen things. Like, it's it's not like magic or anything. Uh, but you know, apparently the almighty Apple computer decided to uh, you know, wrap this magic in behind a paywall. But being because I was like 10, I didn't exactly have a credit card or anything with which to, you know, do this. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't just because I spited them so much. I doubt very many people bought that. Like, I really don't see that. Yeah. Uh, plus, it seemed to like clash so much with Windows mm-hmm. that I especially did not want it on uh, any machine that I was using. Uh by the way, I held the same opinion for a real player. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's like the first thing you uninstall. Yes. Uh, but uh, perhaps one of the ugliest versions uh, was uh, QuickTime Player 4. 
uh, which was like this all new brushed aluminum looking thing that um, had quite a bit of confusing properties, uh, like in the user interface. And I, you know, just put this in the show notes because like this is like some of the, you know, uh, like this company that, you know, prides itself on beautiful and usable mm-hmm. UI design when in fact it's not really. One of the interesting points that they made throughout their article as a theme was the designers tried to pretend this was a device and designed it as such. So even the size of the app and then the, the favorites bar that slides down everything they did, they tried to make it pretend it was an app or, or a physical device or even like the thumb the thumb bar. wheel. Yeah, the thumb wheel. Like, it's all like a physical device to them. Yeah, like, I guess I came along late to the party because I figured out that, like, the little volume display could also control the volume. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't even bother, like, clicking, like, that wheel, like, uh-huh. how many times? <laughs> See, I just used the volume bar, too. You just click on it. You do it by accident. You click it and it goes, oh, cool. I can mute it and I can make it loud. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... You know, goes it goes over some of the uh, pain points, especially this favorites drawer, in that it essentially limits the number of favorites you can have to the resolution of your screen. And if you change the resolution of your screen, then you won't be able to open the favorites drawer if you have too much in it. Yes. Oh, and by the way, they're all black because videos always begin with a black screen. Yes. It the little thumbnails uh, are like from the very first frame of the video, which. Almost always is black. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, like, taking it from, like, halfway through the video or something. Mm-hmm. And there's no text to let you know what the video yeah. might be. Yeah, like, there's no hover text, I don't think. Uh, so I wonder, uh, like, if you had a screen resolution so low, like, yeah, you probably couldn't even open it at all. It did mention that, like, if it didn't have room to open it, it would not open. See, I didn't all the way remember the favorites part, whether I found it by accident once and never figured it out. But, like, to me, that's a hidden button all the way in the bottom. Like, I didn't notice it when I was skimming the article until they called it out. I was like, oh, really? It had that? (laughs) So, uh, oh, yeah, then all the sound files that would happen to be in the favorites just happen to be the same icon. So... You know, it says, like, this is essentially a box of chocolates. At least you can tell them the part from the video files. (laughs) Yeah, but that's still not good enough. (laughs) So, and, uh, you know, also goes over the parts that are a control, like a button or, uh, or, like, that little grippy thing to open that favorites drawer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, there's, like, very weird contrasting going on here. Uh... Like, especially that little Apple icon down at the bottom has the exact same shade as the little speaker icon, which presumably would allow you to mute and unmute the sound. And then uh, what he calls the button that looks like a shirt button (laughs) (laughs) apparently opens up like the uh, uh, essentially the equalizer. Which, you know, like, I'm not exactly sure how, like, this little, you know, circle with some squares in it indicates that. Additional options. It's like a hamburger menu. (laughs) You're just supposed to know these things, okay? Yes. (laughs) Which is a very poor assumption. So, yeah. This this is so bad. Like, I guess this uh, was sort of like a predecessor to, like, the... uh, how what were they just like the default uh apple programs and on like iphones and ipads from like five years ago Mm -hmm. how they were so skeuomorphic which like you know actually skeuomorphic design is essentially like okay so you have like this calendar scheduler application and like it actually looks like it's a leather bound book Uh. and it even has like the page tears on it (laughs) just to make you feel at home Yes. Uh, so I guess this is like one of their very, one of their uh, earlier iterations of that, I, like I guess. Microsoft learned that was a bad idea with Microsoft Bob. Yeah, but I think there were other problems with Microsoft Bob other than that. Kind of like when it told you the password when you couldn't get it up to the first thing times. <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> so, 
uh, yeah, and then also the uh, like how you would organize the favorites uh, is that you know you can delete and rename them, uh, but you couldn't like rearrange them or anything. You can rearrange them. It just doesn't tell you that you can rearrange them. You can drag the slider actually and rearrange them. It doesn't tell you that though. Ah. <sighs> Yeah. But confused. it's okay. When you have the favorites bar open, you won't be able to see the names anyway, so who cares? No, no, no. But, it, but it's okay. The wizards over at Apple Computer will have figured it all out, and you must abide by their rules. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. This guy also tears apart the, uh, apparently, the IBM Real Things applications as well. And he really doesn't like the phone either. <laughs> Uh, let's see, in fact, uh, pull it up here. Uh, this, this has this big table, one with the hype and the other one with like, uh, column with reality, <laughs> the hype, it has a built-in drawer for holding your most used telephone numbers. This drawer works like a physical o- object. It slides in and out the reality. Maybe phones at IBM have drawers underneath them, but not on any of the phones we've ever used that had a drawer. <laughs> so much for the real world metaphor. <laughs> so, you know, again, just if you if you have something on a computer, have it on a computer screen, it should function like other things that are, you know, in the same ecosystem. So, like, instead of, you know, again, like, having a fixed grid, a fixed number of things, that's not exactly how they're supposed to work. (laughs) So, anyways, uh, we had some, a little bit of podcast feedback last time. Uh, Ryan said, Google minus minus. It's hard to not be evil. And I think we kind of agree on that. Uh... So if you'd like to give us any feedback, you can, you can go ahead and do so on Reddit or on the, uh, the show notes page. And, uh, oh yeah, don't forget that today's International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your school morphic programs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, guess that's it. I guess, uh, let's see. I want to do uh, a few more blog posts uh, since I finished that uh, other missed game. Mm -hmm. And also the improvements that I've done on my blog. So, like, the actual code behind it. Like, I've started to multi-thread the loads. So you load up your, like, different posts and stuff faster? Um, actually, it's more like the uh, style sheets. Okay. Or style sheet and JavaScript. Like, just, Mm -hmm. I only have one file of each. Uh, but during the page load, it dynamically calls it from the database. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, faster ways of doing that, caching it. Uh, yeah, I've actually created a uh, like a a view of the file table that does not actually have the file contents in it. So I'm hoping that maybe through that it'll load faster, and it seems to be working. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so yeah, uh, anything exciting happening with you? Ooh, moving pastures around and things like that. It's missed out in deer season. Apparently, there's muzzleloader season, but I thought it started this Saturday, but it actually ended this Saturday. Oh, so missed out on that one. So I have to go squirrel hunting instead. <laughs> so all right. So I guess that's it. So have a good one. You too. The Nexus TV colon podcast from the technological convergence.